Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Salem. Welcome to worship. It's great to see you all this morning. Happy Valentine's Day. I know they're passing out flowers later on in the service, which is going to be fantastic. Oh, my Lord. I know we have some folks still finding their seats, but wherever you're at, let's begin worship in a different way today. Let's If you're sitting down, let's close our eyes. Let's close our eyes and just let go. Just let go. Let go of whatever you're holding on to. Let go of anything, anything that might be keeping you from God this morning. Let go of all the worry, the stress. Let go of all your burdens. This life these days is filled with storms, but he brings peace and calm where there is turmoil. He brings order where there's chaos. Try to picture his face. Can you see it? Can you picture our Lord's gentle countenance wherever you're at this morning? Whatever you're dealing with, just cast your cares on him and be flooded by his peace. Let us pray. Let's pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me be light. And where there is sadness, let me bring your joy. O Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. All thanks to you, my King and my Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We begin our worship today in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us
Amen. Amen. the aisles and give each other big hugs and kisses. I'm just kidding. We actually are just going to wave <laughs> and we're going to share God's peace with one another. <laughs> God bless you guys. God's peace. God's peace to you. And then I have some quick announcements. Good morning again. Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Zach. I'm the director of worship arts here at Salem. And I have just a few, like I said, a few quick announcements. First, please turn your eyes to the, uh, I would say normally please first turn your eyes to the bulletin, but if you're online, turn your eyes to the, to the, uh, to the website, I guess, SalemOrange.com. Uh, Salem is a church who prays for one another, and we'd love to be praying for you. So if you need prayer, you can go through our website, 
um, and request prayer there. You can uh, email deacons at salemorange.com for prayer if you need prayer. Or if you're here with us today and you need prayer, please see me or Adam or Pastor or Kim. Um, we'd love to be praying for you. Um, we are all about prayer here at Salem. Salem's also a church who serves together. We have opportunities to serve people in need every week, whether it's through the church or through uh, the community with Charity on Wheels. Uh, please find a way to plug in if you're not serving in some way. Uh, visit the missions page of our website, again, salemorange.com, or talk to any Salem staff member or uh, anybody who is a member here will probably know how to plug you in. Uh, Salem's also a church who's in the word together, and we have Bible studies in small groups every week. Uh, please visit salemorangeagain.com to find out more about uh, plugging in. And then last but not least, Salem is a church who's in community with one another. We care deeply about this community, and we really want to be a light, a light here in Orange, a light, that city on the hill here in Orange, and make a huge impact for Jesus. So um, please, as we leave this place, you know, let it, let it not just stop here with our worship of God. Let us let us venture out into the community and make a difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, first communion class, this is my last of my announcements. First communion class is next Sunday after worship. Right of first communion is Sunday, March 7th at 9.30 a.m. There's a registration. There's some registration information on our website at www.salemorange.com, which I keep saying. I'm getting pretty good at saying that. Um, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday in case you didn't know, and we will be having a drive-through imposition of ashes right here from 4.30 to 6 p.m., followed by a very, very beautiful and somber online service, which begins at 7 p.m. So please come by. We'd love to see you. Um, again, we're going to have a nice drive-through here to the imposition. I'm gonna, I, we have a, some signs coming in, so we're hoping to catch some of our community who are coming home from work. We think that's going to be an awesome outreach in itself. So anyhow, please join us for that. And now we're going to collect our gifts and our offerings. Oh, and the roses, I'm sorry. There are roses because it's Valentine's Day. Uh, um, and that, that make sure if you're a lovely lady, you grab a rose on your way out. There's a bunch of roses back here, and they're beautiful. So make sure that's a little gift from, from Salem to all of you. And now we're going to collect our gifts and offerings. And you can make an offering through our website at SalemOrange.com. Um, under, resource, there's, under resources, there's a page there for online giving, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, like I say every week, to automate your tithes. It really does, it does, really does help to make things easier uh, as far as staying obedient to God through these difficult times. And thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity to Salem. Um, and now we're going to have a time of confession. Every week as we worship together, we have this opportunity. We get to admit to ourselves, to each other and to God that we don't always live as we're called. But new every morning is God's great love and great mercy for us. Um, so as we are, are, are praying together this prayer of con confession, let us remember that God is merciful and he is just and he is eager, eager to offer his grace. He's eager to offer his grace. So with these, these truths in mind, let us pray. Please make my words your own. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, I am so tired of the sin and the struggle in my life. I feel distant from you. My choices have not led me into right places. Too often I've listened to the whispers of the enemy instead of your words in scripture. And the results have been just disastrous. Today I'm confessing my desperate need for you again. You've promised that if we confess our sin, you will forgive us and make us clean again. I truly need your forgiveness. Repentance is on my heart and my lips. I want to turn around and head another direction, Lord, back to you. Please help me. Please forgive me. Let me remember the terrible price you paid for my sin with your own death. Let me remember how you suffered for me out of your great, great love. I praise you, Lord, for your mercy on me, a sinner saved by grace. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. As we sing this next song, let's say, take some time for just personal examination. and Let us all go to God in prayer and repentance and humbly ask for forgiveness.
without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need Brothers and sisters in Christ, the greatest Valentine's Day gift I can give to you is to share with you and proclaim to you that what Christ did on the cross, the greatest love sacrifice gift ever, that because of what Jesus God himself did, that our sins are forgiven. Therefore, 
as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, happy Valentine's Day. Today is a day that is uh, being celebrated around the United States and around the world, one of love. For those of us, it's a three-day weekend. It's a time to get a lot of sugar, give away roses. Thank you, Brooke and Women's Ministries, for doing that. Yay. Appreciate that. It's also uh, President's Day weekend, and so a number of people are out traveling. And around the world, about 2.5 to 3 billion Protestant Christians and Catholics are celebrating Transfiguration Sunday. And if you would like to read more about that, you can read later on this week or later on today out of Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. But today we continue our series on Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of Christ's followers, the Acts of us. And we'll dive into that in just a moment. But before jumping into that, just wanted to let you know that this Wednesday, if you would care to receive the imposition of ashes where we impose or place, apply ashes upon you, our, our students and staff will be getting it in the morning chapels. But in the afternoon, as Zach said, from 4.30 to 6, if you'd like to drive in here, pull into the first rolling gate, we'll have a little coned-off area, and we'll have uh, a place where you can receive the ashes and then exit the other rolling gate. And we will be using these single-use makeup applicators. I have no idea what these do, but all the women tell me they are great. And we're going to be using these. They have a little bit more uh, sponginess than Q-tips, but they will be single-use application, and you can come and receive the ashes upon your forehead. And so that will be this Wednesday from 4.30 to 6 o'clock, and as Zach said, at 7 o'clock, we have our Ash Wednesday service being broadcast at that time. Well, God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace be to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, as we take a look at Acts chapter 9, I want to start off with an introductory question. I want you to think about the worst villain that you can think of. When you hear the term villain, the antagonist, everyone has a protagonist, and every good story, it seems like, has a good antagonist or a vile antagonist. Who would be your villain, your vile antagonist that you think of? Who's a person that came to your mind immediately? Turn to the person next to you if you're sitting next to somebody and tell them who it might be. Go. All right, shout out some answers. The devil. the devil. Way to go, Wesley. I heard devil. Great job. I heard Zach say Satan. Wow, you go right to it. Anybody else? Voldemort. 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 Yes. He who shall not be named. Who else? The Joker. Yes. Batman's nemesis. Great job, Henny. Yeah, the Joker. Heath Ledger was like the best. Who, Tobias? The Death Star guy. Yes, absolutely. Darth Vader. We'll come back to Darth in just a moment. Anybody else? Are you raising your hand back there? No? All right. Well, I know some of you immediately thought of Yankees. Any Yankee baseball players? Yeah, okay. All right, just throwing that out there. Had to get that if you're an Angel fan. Had to throw that in there. If you're a DC Comics person, you know that Lex Luthor or the Joker. Absolutely. If you're a Marvel fan, it's Thanos. Absolutely. If you're Lord of the Rings, Sauron. 
Harry Potter, we already had Voldemort. Absolutely. There's all kinds of villains in life today. But then you think about those who might turn the page. Villains who end up redeeming themselves. And that's where Darth Vader comes in. Yeah. If you were around in the 70s and 80s and beyond, you knew that Darth Vader kind of takes a turn. If you're a, a classic film aficionado and loved Charles Dickens' productions, Ebenezer Scrooge, a villain. Not that we're getting political, but to some people, Abraham Lincoln was a villain. Especially during the Civil War. To some people, Ronald Reagan was a villain. And yet, the wall came down. Today, we take a look at someone who is seen as a villain in the early church and nowadays looking back. And yet, for him, he was not a villain. He was going after what he thought was important. And I know today, many of people think that what they post on Facebook or social media, what they say to one another, what they do to one another, they might feel that they're in the right. But are the scales still on and they're not seeing what the effects are to the people around them? Well, let's dive into Acts chapter 9. Let's get into God's word and take a look at what God is sharing with us today. We're going to stop at a number of places at the beginning just to kind of give some history, and then we'll take a look at application as we get up, go further. Verse 1 of chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. How many people seem to be constantly on that bandwagon, just breathing out murderous threats around us. We see the chaos and the confusion in the world around us, and we say, how are we ever going to get beyond it? Well, on our own, probably not. And as we see here, it takes God's intervention. He went to the high priest, Caiaphas, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Stop in there real quick as well. So Saul's in Jerusalem, and two chapters ago in Acts chapter 7, he was there for the stoning of Stephen. He was there, and the people laid their cloaks, and he gave his approval as Stephen was stoned first martyr of the church. So this isn't the first time we hear of Saul, but the story continues. Saul was a very important Pharisee at that time. He followed Gamaliel, and yet he was, which was Gamaliel, for those who like historical reference, was part of the Hillel uh, organization of Jewish thought. But Saul's actions kind of focus on the Shammai side of Jewish thing. That's the, the thought of violence, to overcome violence. Back in Leviticus 24 would have been Saul's modus operandi. If someone is taking you away from honoring the Lord, Yahweh, that person should be removed or executed. And so Saul would have been seen as kind of an early villain to the early church. In fact, he asked for letters to synagogues in Damascus. Damascus was 125 miles away from Jerusalem. Think about that. What's 125 miles away from here that someone would feel that strongly to go and remove both men and women from the synagogues, from their house churches, from their village churches, and to bring them back imprisonment back to Jerusalem. It was a pretty scary time. If you've ever watched shows on TV when, when armies or militia or uh, extremists come in 
and start removing people from their homes. That's what was going on here. It was a scary time in the early church. Especially for those who followed the way. Now, why do you think they called it the way? Why didn't they call it, I don't know, heavenites? We're going to heaven. Or why didn't they call it paradise? Ites. Or something along those lines. I think one of the reasons why the early church was called the way, because it's not just a destination. It's a continuing process of discipleship and sanctification. Big words that basically say, I want to be more like God. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like the teacher, the rabbi, our Lord and Savior, a servant to those around us. The way. I think Christianity and Christians get a bad rap nowadays because it's connected with so much of politics and rites and rituals rather than walking in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, following his way. Maybe for some of us, we need to say, all right, how can I follow the way better? Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Back when I was growing up in high school, one of my favorite songs would met was Manfred Mann's Blinded by the Light. Any, any other boomers out there that know that song? Okay, boomer, yeah. One of my favorite songs, I, I, just because it was during high school, I think, or college or grade school, it was around that time frame, Blinded by the Light. I don't know if you've ever been blinded by the light. Maybe you've been in a dark location. Maybe you've been to the Mammoth Caves or maybe you've been to Carlsbad Caverns or maybe you've been in a deep mine or maybe all the power has gone off on the interior of your house and you have no idea which way is up or which way to go. If you've ever felt that, it's very disorienting. And then imagine all of a sudden blinding light shining upon you. You fall to the ground, just as Saul did. And hearing this voice out of heaven, why do you persecute me? I actually was thinking about this. I wonder what the ants and the moles and the worms think every Sunday when we come here. Do they look up and say, who are these voices around us? Yes, Lord. I don't know if they do or not, but I can just imagine Saul who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I've heard this before and I've shared this before. How long can you survive without oxygen? Without oxygen. Like three minutes, something like that, give or take. How long can you survive without water? About three days, give or take. And how many days can you survive without food? I actually don't know the answer to that question, as you can tell. 30, 40 days, we're reminded of Jesus being out in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted. Three days was significant. Can you think of anybody who might have been without food or water in a dark place for three days? Jesus is a great answer, Leanne. Jonah, Lazarus. Oh, that's right, four days. Good call. Just double-checking you. And Saul. Being in complete darkness for three days. A time of, what do you think was going on in his mind? What have I done? What am I going to go to? What's going to happen next? 
In verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on State Street, Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And of course, Ananias says, absolutely, God, I'm going to go straight into Compton. I'm going to go down to Tijuana. I'm going to go into the seediest places I can think of. No, he doesn't. And I'm not saying that Compton is seedy or Tijuana is seedy. It just, they evoke this scaredness, this frightening uh, uh, sense because of history. And sure enough, Saul, who had a history of frightening the early church, what's Ananias' response? Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to Claim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, and to show and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. How many of you have ever suffered because of your faith in Christ? How many of you have ever risked persecution or suffering or had to sacrifice something? Because of your faith. We've got it pretty easy nowadays. We really do. We don't have Gestapo coming after us in our synagogues or house churches. We don't have people coming after us saying, you're going to prison or face death if you're a Christian, if you follow the way. We do have it pretty easy. But what's amazing is in countries where it's not easy, Christianity is exploding. Africa, South America are just blowing up with people following Christ, giving their lives over to Jesus because they're following the way. Because they know they can't do it on their own. They can't face life on their own. And they're looking for something better, and Christ is always better. Jesus is always first. Then Ananias went to the houses and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength.